everyone. You look a lot like the guy who was on TNT, TYT two days ago. That was my twin brother. That was your twin brother? Yeah. Talking about impeachment. And uh, it's a good interview with him. Thank you. Jank? Yeah. Jank. I can never figure Jank. out how to say his name. Yeah, Jank Uger. Does everybody know TYT? Yeah. The Young Turks? Yeah. Oh, yes. oh, yeah. yeah. They're, on, yeah. they're online, yeah. and they uh, we have a relationship. PDA has some kind of a relationship with them. And, uh, they've been... Uh, they're, I, just, I think they're terrific. Yeah. So I listen to them every day. But the other you day, do every day. Good well, yeah, pretty much every day. But yeah. yes, I think it was yesterday I turned them on and there was John Bonnet. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, he was rehearsing for today. That's yeah. right. That's, yeah. that's right. <laughs> this is John Bonfast. He's uh, chair of Free Speech for People. Though I think today he's here on his own accord since we are not yet Probably. in 501c3 yeah, right. or exactly. whatever we have to be to have you come here. Yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I'll turn it over to John. I don't think you need a great introduction. All right. Thank you, Russell. Thank you all for allowing me to come before you to talk about this question of holding our president accountable via the impeachment process. Uh, so as Russell mentioned, I'm, I'm with Free Speech for People, and we are a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that's been dedicated for nearly 10 years now to defending our Constitution and our democracy primarily focused around challenging big money in politics and unchecked corporate power. But after the November 2016 election, we decided as a board that we could not be true to our mandate of taking on big money in politics and unchecked corporate power without also taking on the unprecedented corruption coming into the White House with the president-elect stating that he would not be divesting from his business interests and therefore the moment took the oath of office was on a collision course with the two anti-corruption provisions of the Constitution, the Foreign Emoluments Clause and the Domestic Emoluments Clause, uh, both of which make clear that the President cannot be engaged in making profits while sitting in the Oval Office. And the reason for that and the Foreign Emoluments Clause point is that we don't want to have a President who is beholden to foreign interests. Uh, when they're supposed to be engaged in representing the American people. And on the domestic emoluments clause side, we also don't want a president who's partial to one or more states over other states uh, and <coughs> making a profit in certain states over others. Uh, so the framers placed those provisions in the Constitution as means to combat a corruption. Uh, and that was the first impeachable offense uh, of this president. We launched this campaign with Roots Action on the day of the inauguration at impeachdonaldtrumpnow.org. Since then, 1.4 million Americans have signed on in support of that campaign. 17 communities, including a number here in Massachusetts, have passed resolutions calling on Congress to uh, take this action of starting impeachment proceedings. Uh, more recently, Lindsay Savadosa, state representative, of course, representing this area, and State Senator Joe Comerford have introduced that same kind of resolution before the state legislature in Massachusetts have Massachusetts to be the first state to call on Congress to take this action. And we also have expanded the grounds for this campaign. Uh, unfortunately, the emoluments clauses were not the only <laughs> Uh, violations uh, that this president has uh, committed that deserve impeachment proceedings against him. And we now have 11 grounds, and I'll just briefly go through them, uh, and uh, I'm happy to further discuss any of this, but these are the other grounds. Obstructing justice. Uh, this was actually the first ground in the Articles of Impeachment that were passed by the House Judiciary Committee in 1974 against then-President Richard Nixon. This president, of course, came into office demanding loyalty uh, from his FBI director, James Comey. When he didn't get that, uh, he then uh, went to uh, him and he said he thought that the investigation, the FBI investigation into his National Security Advisor Michael Flynn should be let go. He asked him to just let it go. And when he didn't get that, he fired James Comey. 
And then he went on national television on NBC with Lester Holt, and he told the American people why he did it. He did it to shut down the Russia investigation. That's exhibit A for obstruction of justice. There's been many other ways in which he's engaged in obstructing justice, including constantly attacking the special counsel's investigation, which of course emerged out of the firing of the FBI director James Comey, constantly calling it a witch hunt, demanding uh, that it stop. Uh, but we don't really need to have more than what occurred in those early months of the administration to know that he's deserving of an impeachment investigation around that ground of obstruction of justice. Uh, then we have the conspiracy to solicit uh, and then conceal illegal assistance, foreign assistance, for his presidential campaign. Federal campaign finance law makes clear that foreign nationals have no role in our elections, uh, no role spending money independently, no role making contributions directly to campaigns. And we already know that in July of 2016, there was this meeting in Trump Tower during the presidential campaign at which the officials, senior officials, including his son, Donald Trump Jr., were told that they were going to be able to get dirt on Hillary Clinton, uh, President Trump's opponent during the 2016 election. That meeting was a solicitation that was illegal. Regardless of whether or not they got anything out of that meeting, to solicit something of value from a foreign national is illegal under federal campaign finance law, and we already know that that occurred. Um, then we have abusing the pardon power. Uh, this, of course, occurred in August of 2017 when the president decided to pardon former Sheriff Joe Arpaio of Maricopa County, Arizona, who was not only found to have violated the constitutional rights of thousands of people in Arizona based on the color of their skin, locking them up, detaining them indefinitely. But then he was found in civil contempt of court, in federal court, for not stopping those violations, for continuing to go on uh, with that unconstitutional behavior. And then when he was not complying with the order by the court to stop and the civil contempt order, he was then found in criminal contempt of court. Uh, and then, as he was seeking to appeal all that, he was pardoned uh, by this president. He was uh, you know, told by the president that he was just doing his job and, and, and that that was why he was pardoning him. This, of course, sets a very dangerous message to law enforcement officials all over the country that you can willfully violate the constitutional rights of people, due process, equal protection rights. You can then find yourself in civil contempt of court, criminal contempt of court, and the president might pardon you. Uh, this is why it's such a dangerous <coughs> abuse of the pardon power, and while the pardon power, some people think, is unlimited, it's not when it comes to this kind of situation where you have a law enforcement official who's been violating people's constitutional rights. Those very constitutional rights, due process and equal protection rights, were brought into the Constitution after the pardon power, uh, and so the framers uh, who of course, enacted the Bill of Rights as well, uh, in, intended to have a check on that part and power in this instance. Then we have undermining freedom of the press. Uh, this is a president who constantly attacks uh, the, the, the press, calls them enemy of the people, uh, demands that their licenses be taken away, uh, suggests that they could be locked up or even beaten up. Uh, in fact, the publisher of the New York Times recently met with President Trump and he urged him to tone it down because his rhetoric was causing threats against reporters all over the world. The, the reports of threats of violence against journalists were way up uh, around the world because, in, in the publisher's view of the New York Times, because of the President's actions. Uh, then we have directing or seeking to direct law enforcement, including the Department of Justice and the FBI, to prosecute political adversaries for improper purposes. Now this also was an, a part of the Articles of Impeachment passed by the House Judiciary Committee in 1974 against Richard Nixon. He was trying to use 
misuse the IRS to go after political adversaries, misuse the FBI. Um, and here we know this president has constantly sought to have his Department of Justice, as he sees it, his Department of Justice, to prosecute Hillary Clinton and her associates to go after James Comey. Uh, you know, he's in, in his Twitter feed has plenty of evidence there of, of the kind of threats he's made against political adversaries, again, to misuse law enforcement. And we, we expect this of dictatorships and authoritarian regimes around the world, but not in the United States. Uh, then, then we have advocating illegal violence and undermining equal protection of the laws. This president has given aid and comfort to white supremacists and neo-Nazis. He said after Charlottesville mm -hmm. that there was blame on both sides, that, that in fact the neo-Nazis and white supremacists who were marching and the peaceful protesters who were also marching, that there was somehow blame on both sides and that there were, both sides had fine people. This sends again a, a message to those who are white supremacists and neo-Nazis in this country that the president has uh, their back. Uh, and it's not just that instance. He's tweeted out inflammatory anti-Muslim videos that came out of Britain uh, that are very insightful. He's at his rallies, encouraged violence. Uh, even recently, uh, a BBC cameraman was beaten up uh, by uh, a, a person who was attending one of his rallies in full view of the president and everyone else, and, and the rhetoric uh, incited that. Uh, then we have ordering the cruel and unconstitutional imprisonment of children and their parents mm -hmm. uh, at the southern border. Now, as many of you may know, the Supreme Court has been clear for decades that when you cross the border in this country, whether you cross it legally or without documentation, the moment you cross the border, wherever you cross it, you are entitled to the protections under the Constitution of Due Process, Equal Protection. And that's been well established. What this president and his administration has done at the southern border is to completely violate those constitutional rights of people showing up to them. take children, as Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky has said, to essentially engage in state-sponsored kidnapping, to move them into cages, separate them from their parents, providing no due process, no equal protection. And then on top of that, we have the violations of their Eighth Amendment rights against cruel and unusual punishment. But we also don't even need to solely rely on the Constitution when it comes to this ground. Uh, you know, Michael Moore, as you may have seen in his recent movie, found the last living Nuremberg prosecutor living in upstate New York, 95 years old, went to see him, and he interviewed him about this practice at the southern border, and that uh, man talked about this being a crime against humanity. Uh, he, he knew from how he engaged in Nuremberg what he was dealing with. Uh, so it's a very serious abuse of power and deserves impeachment of proceedings. Then we have recklessly threatening nuclear war against foreign nations. He's done that against North Korea. He's done that against Iran. We recognize that the president under the Constitution has the role of commander-in-chief, and that enables the president to determine how we go to war, but not whether we go to war. As some of you may know I've been quite involved on that subject in a different context, dealing with the start of the Iraq War, which was an illegal and unconstitutional invasion of Iraq. The president does not have the power to start a war uh, against another nation, but that's essentially what happened uh, with the Iraq War, and has happened many other times uh, since the Korean War where the war powers clause has been violated. Leaving that question aside about the power that the president has commander-in-chief, the reckless endangerment of our nation and of our world to a first strike nuclear attack uh, is something that deserves an impeachment investigation, the abuse of power associated with that. We cite in our book um, this question of what happened to a soldier who was supposed to be checking on the parachutes under training exercises that his fellow soldiers were engaging in, and he decided he didn't 
want to stay on the job that day and check those parachutes. And luckily, his superiors determined that he had uh, been uh, negligent, and they caught problems with the parachutes before they were used. He was cited uh, in court martial for reckless endangerment of his fellow soldiers. Um, and if that kind of situation is deserving of scrutiny and punishment, then surely a president who recklessly threatens nuclear war against other nations and endangers the world is deserving of that scrutiny as well. Uh, then we have, finally, abusing the emergency powers under the National Emergency Powers Act of 1976 to build and fund a wall at the southern border that Congress explicitly refused to fund in direct violation of the separation of powers principles that are embedded in our Constitution. Article 1 makes clear that only Congress has the power to appropriate money, uh, and, it is, and it's not the President's power at all to decide where monies go. And here, it wasn't just a situation where, you know, there, Congress didn't answer him, didn't respond on his request to build a wall. They, they responded twice, as we know. First, he decides to shut down the government in December of 2018 over this dispute, um, and for five weeks keeps it shut down. Congress still refuses to fund his wall. He then reopens it um, on a short basis to have them go back to the table, supposedly, and negotiate this. They come back a second time, and a second time pr provide no money for this wall. So on two occasions, they've explicitly refused to fund it. James Madison said that the very definition of tyranny is when the executive seizes legislative powers, and that's what's happening here. And of course, it's not just about the seizure of legislative powers to try to build this wall. It raises the question of what more will the president do with these emergency powers? Will he try to shut down the internet? Will he try to lock up protesters, attack them? Will he uh, declare martial law? I mean, this is the kind of danger we have with a president who so recklessly disregards the Constitution uh, and his oath of office. Finally, I just want to address the Mueller investigation. The impeachment power is in the Constitution to deal very precisely with this kind of abuse of power, abuse of public trust, crimes against the state. There is nothing whatsoever in the impeachment power in the history of why the impeachment power came into the Constitution that says that you first have to have a criminal conviction or even a criminal charge before starting impeachment proceedings. So when we hear members of Congress say we have to wait for the Mueller investigation to be completed before starting the impeachment process, we really are being deceived. Uh, this is not this is not the same question. The Mueller investigation, which ought to be protected, is a criminal investigation as to whether or not the president or any of his associates committed crimes under the federal criminal code in coordination with the Russian government interfere with the 2016 election or uh, with respect to obstruction of justice. Two of the 11 grounds that I've just gone over, but only two of those. The question for impeachment is, again, crimes against the state. And many of the grounds that I just referenced are not even being covered by the Mueller investigation. So we do not need to wait, and we ought not to wait for the Mueller investigation to be completed. Uh, and finally, the remedy associated with the criminal investigation is punishment in the criminal justice process, which could include jail time. The remedy associated with the impeachment power is removal from office to prevent future harm to the republic. So we have the impeachment power there not as a means by which we hold someone accountable later on you know, down the road. It's designed to address a current and present threat to our republic. And this president is a direct threat to our republic today. Which gets to the final point, which is when we hear people say, including Congressman Eric Swallow of California, that we either impeach him in Congress or we'll impeach him at the ballot, 
I mean, that's just really clever language, but it's, it's absolutely got nothing to do with the impeachment process. We don't impeach at the ballot. We engage in elections at the ballot. So to say we're going to wait until 2020 to hold this president accountable completely <coughs> disregards the very purpose of the impeachment power. If we think he's a direct and present threat to our republic, we ought to use the impeachment power now. Uh, and, and that, I think, is why Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib last week announced, and I was proud to be here with her for this announcement, that she will soon introduce a resolution for starting impeachment proceedings against this president. We have drafted a resolution that her office is now reviewing. Uh, we hope that there will be other members that join her. Um, and I, I certainly think that this congressional delegation here in Massachusetts ought to hear from all of us that they ought to be joining Congresswoman Tlaib when she introduces that later this month, as she's pledged to do. Um, and, you know, the House Judiciary Committee in particular, where this investigation would have to start, needs to hear from us as well. Now is not the time for traditional congressional oversight. Now is the time for members of Congress to face this extraordinary moment in history, to confront this constitutional crisis threatening our nation, and to start an impeachment investigation against this president. And this is not just about Donald Trump. This is about all of us. Who are we as a people? What are we as a nation? In the face of this constitutional crisis, we must rise. We must rise to defend our Constitution, to defend our democracy, and to defend that bedrock principle that no one is above the law, not even the President of the United States. The time for impeachment proceedings is now. Thank you. I have a, a, political, I have a, I have a political question yes. for you. Given the, the amount of issues, and two or three of them would have been enough. Yes. Given them, how do you explain that the, the base that Trump has doesn't seem to be de decreasing? I keep waiting for it to go down. Yeah. Well, I think there's a couple things what here. I, I, think, I think there's a couple things here. One, one is, is that there, is not, there has not been the case made to the American people in a coherent way that needs to happen via the impeachment process as to why this president is such a threat to our nation, right? I mean, there's political rhetoric that we hear, and there's this, oh, we're waiting on the Mueller report rhetoric that we hear. Mm -hmm. But what we're missing, what we don't have, is laying out this case, you know, as Congress could do through the impeachment process in a way that would elevate the national discussion, educate people on why we have impeachment in the Constitution, and what impeachable offenses have already uh, occurred. Uh, you know, again, there's a deception happening, starting with Nancy Pelosi on down, when they say that we need to know whether there are crimes that have been committed. That is not the, the standard okay. for impeachment. So I think part of what's happening here is we're not making the cases as, as a whole, as a public, um, you, you know, uh, on this. And that's one thing. But the second thing I will say is that when Richard Nixon left the White House in that famous helicopter ride on August 9, 1974, he still had approximately 30% of the public uh, behind him. Um, so while it's true that, that there ought to be some movement you know, from the Republican side, if the standard had been in 1973 when the when the first impeachment process began. If the standard then had been by the House Judiciary Committee chair uh, that we're not going to start anything until we have bipartisan support, Richard Nixon never would have faced an impeachment proceeding. And that is, that is to be clear, Congressman Nadler's standard. He wants to see somehow a bipartisan support for impeachment before he starts. No, the process needs to start, and the bipartisanship will come along after that. Thank you. I yes. just want to say a word about the, the Trump supporters. Uh, John spoke in Pittsfield about two weeks ago and laid out much of the same argument. And a woman who was obviously, I think you handled her very well, a Trump supporter stood up and said, well, the emoluments clause doesn't really, doesn't really hold because everyone knows that Trump lets people stay in his hotel for free. 
And we, some of us, <laughs> everyone else in the audience thought this woman was like being sarcastic, but she was someone who, I don't know where she got her information, and John dealt with it in a very nice way, but I think there is a portion of the population that has bought the, the, the media is all false news, it's fake news, it's all lies, yeah. don't believe it. She was convinced yes. that this was she the was. case, and John said, well, listen, look at my book, and Get at the library and look at the references in the back. And so you don't see, have to buy my book. You don't have to buy my book. But I think yes. it's yes. in terms of trying to move the percentage of the Trump supporters to do this, I think it's going to be very difficult mm -hmm. because they're, I think a lot of them are really in a different factual world than mm -hmm. the rest of them. And you're not going to be able to convince them by arguing. Anything no. you say, they'll just say it's fake news. So exactly. what, what, what it takes is somebody who who is in their tribe already, who can speak to them, who, who has gained their trust. A friend of mine has been writing at some month about this, that you know, the, the idea is to first gain, gain the trust, get to know these people on some other level, you know, help them mow their lawn, chill their driveway, something, so, to the point where they finally begin to accept you as part of their tribe and you can talk to them about these things. Otherwise, you're just an outsider who doesn't know anything. And yeah. you, don't, you don't, you know, I, I, and I think you may be right that the, well, I think you are right. You have to start the impeachment proceedings that people are talking about this to the extent where it can filter down to those few. I mean, nothing much happened against, I think it's correct, right, that with, with Nixon, things really had to fall to 30% to get anything done. We've been stuck at 40%, and, and because we haven't been talking about impeachment enough, except for you, thank you, <laughs> you know, we haven't normalized it enough. We haven't gotten people having this conversation even, and there's no hope of being able to convince people. You know, of being able to do this, engage in this way. I also think that there's the problem that I think that a certain number of the Democrats feel that this will be, uh, St. John's times we walked over here, a weakened president who they'd like to run against in 2020, so they don't want to get rid of him and have, a, I, it's, I think, contradiction in terms, if you think of an empowered Pence. I mean, Pence seems to be a cut-out figure, but I think that I hear all you're saying, all you're saying, all the stuff goes, it's going down, I just don't, no disagreement, right, end up disagreeing with you to say we ought to be in impeachment. Now, the reason why I disagree with you is because the only way we're going to get there is we get 20 Republican senators yeah. to, to be put in a position where Everybody sees that the facts are so overwhelming that they can't whip you know that that if, so if, they, if they vote let me finish yeah, that right. if they vote to acquit mm -hmm. that it yeah. ruins their political career. It is that so so I think we it, it, the moral report should be out fairly soon and and well, we need to narrow down a relatively few number of charges where it's you know undeniable. So, so can I just overwhelming say, can I, you know, evidence. Let, let's I, you know, so here's the thing, right? It takes 67 votes to convict, no question about it. I encourage you to read Yanni Applebaum's piece in the March issue of The Atlantic, the cover stories in Peach, where he, where he very forcefully makes the case that even if, even if you don't have the votes to convict, you have to go forward with the charges to not set this dangerous precedent that you allow someone to so willfully violate the Constitution rule of law and never face yeah. charges. That, that being said, I'm going to answer more directly than what Yanni Applebaum has said, which is this. If we also, independent of the test of having bipartisanship, if we also had the test of making sure we had the 67 votes to convict before any impeachment process would start against Richard Nixon, then also Richard Nixon would never face impeachment proceedings. So let me just but read from Frank types, Rich. What's well, maybe maybe so. Maybe, maybe so. But Frank Rich, Frank Rich actually in his New York Magazine piece uh, last fall, he highlighted this very history. He said, it's important to remember, a veteran New York Times journalist now with New York Magazine, it's important to remember that the unrelenting lockstep loyalty of the feckless GOP leadership and the parties based to Trump are not indicators of his fate. An occasional outlier in the Jeff Flake vein aside, Nixon's party was wholly loyal to him too. Like today's Vichy Republicans, they remain loyal despite the indictments of cabinet members and aides as close to Nixon as Manafort, Cohen, and Michael Flynn have been to Trump. They remain loyal after the nation was riveted by the devastating Watergate hearings of the summer of 1973, which portrayed all the president's men as counterparts to the mobster scene in the previous year's Hollywood hit, The Godfather. They remain loyal 
even that fall, when Nixon's firing of the special prosecutor in the Saturday Night Massacre at the committee during the 1974 impeachment inquiry, pointed out in a Times op-ed piece 10 days ago when he was writing this, Nixon's defenders routinely dismissed Watergate investigations as a political, quote-unquote, witch hunt intended to reverse the Democrats' 1972 electoral defeat. As late, this is Rich going on, as late as the end of July 1974, less than two weeks before Nixon's August 9th helicopter departure from the White House lawn, most Republicans on the House Judiciary Committee voted against all articles of impeachment. Many Republicans on the committee continued to support him, even after the August 5th release of the smoking gun tape revealing that Nixon had ordered a cover up the Watergate crime. So that history tells us that if we wait for the 67 votes to appear before we start impeachment, we will never be able to start impeachment. And the Burlington Free Press, I'll just say, is one of the many papers that editorialized on this at that time prior to the start. They said there was not a snowball chance in hell that there would be 67 votes to convict. But they were okay with the impeachment process going forward. They were clear. There's not even a chance of this. And that was constantly quoted by editorials around the country. So that is where we are right now. That same place of where the Burlington Free Press was is where we are. People think there's no way you're going to get 67 votes. I agree with Yanni Applebaum, but I also think it misjudges where we could go with the evidence being laid out methodically and the liability that the Republicans will face by sticking with this guy when he's so clearly seen as a head of a crime syndicate. And I want to disagree with something that you said, which is I don't think there's going to be a Mueller report. I agree with you. I don't think there's going to be a Mueller report. I agree with Mueller you. Mueller has been very carefully... Yeah. Uh, he, he, he releases yeah. it, there's a chance it'll be buried. <laughs> but, but I agree with you. I don't <laughs> even think there's going to be one. I, I, he has been very carefully in all of his indictments laying the cases that, that, that Congress needs to follow. All the breadcrumbs are there yeah. for the stuff that he's been investigating. That is his report. That, that is his report. That, that is his report. That is his report. <laughs> that is his report. Yeah. yeah. I mean, this is a fiction. You know, every, every, every once in a while we hear, it's coming out. It's yeah. coming out. It's going yeah. to be. It's just a couple weeks ago. It's coming out. Yeah. It's a joke, really. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll be pleasantly surprised if I see yeah. some comprehensive yeah. thing being but but that's fine. We can yeah. disagree. But I mean, at the bottom, at, at the end of the day, though, again, the Mueller report relying on that before we start means that we're putting apples and oranges together. This is not the same thing. This is that's a, I, there's not I think that's the mistake that you're making. I think what the American public wants is some orderliness and doing things in the sequence that's been talked about for the last eighteen months. I think is really, really important for the stability of our society. And, and whether that's right or wrong, I think my, my sense is if we try and short circuit or there is no Mueller report, I think there's enough dangerous, violent people in this society that you don't, may not remember 1967, 68, but I do. It was a painful time, physically and intellectually. Yeah. Everything you're saying, I think I agree with. But I think if there's a sense that there's no order to what's going on, you know, half the people didn't even vote in the last election. That's how disengaged they are. So now we're going to end up in a publicity battle all over between whether the, the Mueller report is factual or not, or whether this is a takeover, quote unquote, of the government by doing, of the government by the impeachment process. And I can see this becoming what everybody becomes but Yanni really Applebaum. concerned about. Yeah, I hear you. I hear you. Yanni, Yanni Applebaum explosive. addresses this and actually argues that the polarizing situation we have now would be better addressed via a orderly impeachment process. I'm not suggesting that we start with voting on articles of impeachment and sending them over to the Senate tomorrow. No, I'm suggesting no, a formal set of impeachment hearings, proceedings that start in the House Judiciary Committee, providing clear order for it. You know, the Republicans will get their chance to say what they want to say in each of those hearings. We'll have nationally televised, uh, you know, a presence and attention to this. His point in that piece, I urge you to read it because it's very powerful. He makes the point that where we are now, if we don't provide that national constitutional order, we're actually going down that other Road that yeah. we're already kind of in that dangerous place, and and the impeachment process can provide the very kind of order that we we need. Um, my question is, um, yes. with all the different um, hearings and or investigations going on, Adam Schiff, and I mean, is that could that possibly build up to some of the things that you mentioned that would 
become impeachment. Maybe, maybe, but I fear that what's going on here is if the leadership of the House has decided that they're going to hold a bunch of hearings in all these committees, mm -hmm. they're going to say they're going to engage in serious oversight, yeah. they're going to essentially attempt to tar the president further with all this and set it up for 2020, where they then think he'll be damaged so much through all their hearings that they can then run against him. That supposes, assumes, that it will be a fair and free election, yeah. that the president will not further coordinate with one or more foreign powers to rig it, uh, right? I mean, it really, I, I think, is stunning the way in which the leadership of the House is, is assuming all that, uh -huh. that they can just kind of treat this as right. a normal, you know, ordinary chapter in history. Uh, where they have their checks and balances. Yep. And the other thing I have to say, is I, I actually really do believe that at this point, what we're dealing with here is a situation where the American people were told in November of 2018, vote this way, and we're going to check this president. And then they voted that way, and they got a different kind of uh, command of the, of the House of Representatives, and there's no check. It's not happening. Having a bunch of oversight hearings is not a check on his president in the middle of his abuses of power. So, so they can't use those hearings to hold it? Theoretically, they could. Okay. But I think well, that... information may come out of those hearings, which... Maybe, you could say maybe, but, but I think that what's unfortunate right now is that it's so dispersed. If you really wanted to focus in on this as being a question of this impeachment, you would not put it in many different domains. Yeah, I, I agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I might have missed it when I... Outside, but um, the, the notion of Pence, yeah, succeeding. Yeah, what have you? Last time you talked to us, you had some thoughts on. Well, so Mike Pence, number one, is not necessarily innocent in all yeah. of this. He was well aware of what was going on with Mike Flynn during the transition. He was in charge of the transition. He was well aware of the reasoning that was being used, the false reasoning for firing James Comey. Um, and so I think we have to wait and see whether he it gets further implicated by the Mueller through investigation. The oh, the Mueller? Well, through the process as well. Thing again. No, no, I'm through saying... I, I, what through I'm an saying, impeachment process. I think the impeachment process would also expose that. But I, but I think that whether or not he is implicated, at the end of the day, he will be under much tighter constitutional scrutiny if he becomes president with this president being removed from the Oval Office. Mm -hmm. And the precedent that we set by saying we don't want the other guy, so we're going to keep this lawless president in there, is far too dangerous for future administrations. Mm -hmm. As much as I don't agree with Mike Pence on, on, on anything and, and, and think he would be a dangerous president for progressive values that I care about, the real question is, are we going to let the Constitution need to be trampled on so, by this president? Well, I think he's a big piece of the vacillating something people are doing. You know, should we do this? Should we not? Do but this? then, what they're Where's really the what they're really doing is they're putting the politics over the principle. Yeah. So there's something else that, that I'm really afraid of. I mean, you're 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 afraid of chaos coming out of something that's not orderly. I'm afraid of, uh, you know, we we have this guy who, if he doesn't get impeached, um, had better get re-elected. Well. You know, he hopefully will get impeached. But as soon as he's he's got he's got to know he's going to end up in jail. As soon as he's out of office, he's going to end up in jail. Mm -hmm. And you know, he's got so many things, so many charges against him at this point, and so much evidence there. He's going to want to be and stay in power, and he is has a record now of doing whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. So what I'm afraid of is, is that you know we will have an insanely uh, undemocratic. Right. Election. Yes, we'll have yeah, a, I'm afraid of that too. We will have an <laughs> election that is not an election at all. Yeah, that is yeah, right. invading. But in, nothing yeah. has gone into protecting mm -hmm. our our system against yeah. against foreign invasion of the electronics. Yeah. Nothing yeah. has gone. You know, we haven't updated any of our voting systems. Mm -hmm. We are in. Yeah. I mean, this is what I'm scared of. Mm -hmm. I mean, if this guy is not out of office, mm -hmm. he is going to be fighting tooth and nail using every tool he's got, and he has no compunctions about. Breaking the law, yeah. or lying about anything, or lying about, or, lying about or making facts up, yeah. or you know, yeah. he just says it's his, it's his world, it's his high. You know, I sort of end up going back to John's basic point, which is we have a constitution that's supposed to be the order 
that runs this country. I mean, you can debate whether it actually is or not, but it seems to me when someone has so obviously, you know, broken the law and has done un unconstitutional acts, and if as a country we sort of let it go, then the next person, whoever and it is, weakens it. It, it completely weakens it. We're talking about chaos. You know, where the president basically, I mean, this whole sort of Justice Department rule that you can't indict a sitting president, and I've heard it debated back and forth, and it isn't a law, it's a tradition, basically. Um, but once you encase that in stone, who knows who comes in, some kind of a strong man comes in and creates a national emergency and decides that we don't need an election. I mean, it's, you know, the, the proverbial, not just a slippery slope, but it's, you know... It basically so throws constitutional order out the window completely. So yeah. since Russell has so eloquently made the principal point, I will make the political <laughs> I, I, I won't repeat. I think that was very well said. But I will make the political point that we haven't yet discussed here, and I'm doing this in my independent capacity, not with free speech or people. Uh, but David Jolly, who uh, you know, is a former Republican member of Congress, now registered as independent, he wrote a piece in USA Today uh, a few days after uh, a piece that Congresswoman Tlaib and I wrote in the Detroit uh, Free Press in early January calling for the start of impeachment proceedings. And in his piece, first he said that Congresswoman was correct, uh, that she should, uh, and Democrats should start impeachment proceedings. But then he says this, he says, voters who went to the polls in November did not expect Democrats to successfully enact a progressive agenda if they were to win the House or the Senate in 2018. Medicare for All, a Green New Deal, comprehensive immigration reform, they would each be pursued in contrast to the disjointed policies of the President and eventually make up an attainable platform for the party in 2020. But the voters did expect two things from a Democratic House. A hard stop to the continued enactment of Trumpian policies and a direct, deliberate, and fierce response to the president's known wrongdoing. wrongdoing. Voters who turned out in November to usher in a blue wave will not walk away from the cause if Democratic leaders demonstrate now with honest conviction that Trump cannot be trusted with the powers of the presidency, that impeachment is on the table, and that he will not be afforded the credibility traditionally given to his predecessors. But if Democratic congressional leaders miss this opportunity, many voters who were there for them in November likely won't be in 2020. So that's the other assumption that's being made. In addition to the assumption that we're going to have a free and fair election, and you know there's not going to be any coordination with foreign powers, is the assumption that the same energy in November 2018 will be there in November 2020 if we just have a bunch of oversight hearings, pass some message bills, Green New Deal, HR1, all things that I personally support, but at the end of the day have nothing to show for actually holding this president accountable before November 2020. That's a real danger. And, it, and it's worse than that, because the other thing this president is going to be doing in the whole Republican administration is going to be doing is trying to tear apart Democrats the same way they succeeded in 2016 and making, you know, people will not come out from the polls because they will be demoralized. Mm -hmm. So that's really what I'd love to see a group like this talking about is figuring out how are we going to not let them do that. Go ahead. High crimes and misdemeanors. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. I was listening one of the talking heads, and there is no clear test that it's meant to be subjectively, whatever those guys were voting, if they think it's, you know, high crimes and misdemeanors, then it is. If they don't, it's not. So the point I was trying to make before is having enough evidence that they would fail the laugh test by saying that's not high crime. I mean, how did Bill Clinton get off, right? You know, whatever it is he did, they didn't see it. They, they managed to say it wasn't a high crime and misdemeanor. Mm -hmm. And so we had that subjective aspect. And, and the only way, the reason why I'm so forceful in my argument here, is, is that the only way we're going to get 67 votes is it has to be a total embarrassment for them to say that's not a high crime and misdemeanor. But the only way we're going to even get to that right. is if we start having the impeachment investigation. Again, Congresswoman yeah. Lee's resolution is not to have a vote in the House of Representatives on the floor to send the charges over to the Senate. It's to start the impeachment inquiry in the House. And then we will lay out all of these aspects. And it may very well be that some of them don't get included and other ones get emerged. But Alexander Hamilton did address this question 
of what is intended with the impeachment power, and he said it's the misconduct of public men, or in other words, from the abuse or violation of some public trust. Uh, you know, and I, I think there is more beyond that. I mean, George Mason actually talked about if you are corruptly obtaining the office, that is an impeachable offense. So you, you, we hear also among the punditry and among the you know House leadership that impeachment doesn't necessarily cover what happened before he came to the office. Oh, took the oath of office. That's actually patently untrue. If you corruptly obtain an office, the actions that you took to take those you know, corruptly obtaining that office are also impeachable. So, I, I, you know, many people have said this is worse than Watergate already. I, I, don't, I don't think that we have much of a disagreement here that the evidence is more than sufficient to start an impeachment inquiry in the House, and that's really where we got to begin. If I push, I push yeah, push back. back. I'll, I'll be real quick. Yes. But to get those 67 votes... Yeah. We, it, 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 I think what we really have to be able to show that it's clear that there was a conspiracy with the Russians. He conspired with the Russians. I'm willing to, to, to accept <laughs> that there will be a fight to get those 67 votes, but I'm really focused on the current fight, which is get the thing started. I, yeah, yeah, kill it. Yeah. I, I, my thought went away a long time ago. <laughs> oh, okay. I just think that list that you went, I mean, it went on oh, and on and on. Right. That yeah. if people believe one or two, it's an Yeah, one or two, right. List. The bombing of Cambodia was an issue in the Nixon Watergate hearings and ultimately was not decided as, a, as an impeachable offense. I think it should have been. been. But, you know, I mean, there's a lot that you can yeah. put out there, but I we don't have that a, all of There's accepted. another whole level that didn't really rise to what the Nixon experience is that Trump is unraveling, you know, as a person. Yeah. In terms of listening to him talk, yeah. in terms of his connection to reality. Yeah. And I, I would think that at a certain point, you talk about getting to 67, that the Republican establishment is, is at a certain point is going to make a decision if we follow this guy down the rat yeah. the <laughs> hole, it is going to be a problem for us, not just him, yeah. but for the 23 Republicans who are running for re-election in the Senate. Yeah. You know, I mean... His experience, this last experience in North Korea, you know, his just Everything. listening to him talk. Nixon was a crook. There's no question about it. But he he was a person who seemed to be able to, was managing the government in a sense. This is a guy who has most of his you know cabinet or, or are not are not appointed. I mean, his the government is shrinking because he can't get people. I mean, there's a level of dysfunction. In the government, that is, you know, you talk about chaos, that is very different than what we experienced in, in, in Watergate. And I think that that will, at a certain point, filter in when you see the kind of investigation which brings up these charges and brings proof of these charges, and you have someone who was unstable. That that you know, at a certain point, a decision gets made that, you know, if I want to be the senator from Tennessee, I can't be. You know, riding around with Mr. Trump anymore. Yeah, I, I just uh, think of all, of all this stuff. Say he's charged this level of government ever pays the price for anything. Um, so I think, I think the route you're suggesting is the best and only route is to get this guy what he really is, paint the picture for everybody very well. And not worry about what's good, uh, what goes after that. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of stuff on Facebook about people who want to, yeah. well, you know, hang him or whatever. You know, just they want him to go to jail. They say, after, I think it was pointed out that once he's out of office, he's anybody's yeah. game. Yeah. New York can, mm -hmm. can tie him up and throw him away. But, uh, but I, I, I think that's unrealistic. I mean, in spite of what a. <laughs> We get the idea. Ooh, yeah, right. <laughs> um, I, I don't think that he's going to have to pay. I mean, look at the people he's surrounded himself with. He's a gangster, anyhow. Gangsters don't pay either. They get money, you know. So, well, how do you explain the Democratic leaders, including Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, their reluctance to, to touch this whole thing? Sure. How, how I mean, I, I, again, because they have this idea that. Uh, he will be a better opponent for them mm -hmm. in 2020 and that they can beat him in 2020 than if it's Mike Pence. Yeah. 
um, and that there will be this backlash. They have this, they have this uh, short-term memory around the Bill Clinton impeachment mm -hmm. rather than the longer-term view of the Nixon impeachment. Right. So they think. But Bernie must remember the Nixon. Yeah, yeah, but they but they somehow think that Mark, they somehow think first of all they wrongly they wrongly understand what happened in the Clinton impeachment. Al Gore has said that one reason why he did not, and you know, of course, he did get more votes than uh, yeah. George Bush in two thousand, but that's a separate issue. Yeah. But but one reason why uh, he claims that he lost the presidency is because of the nineteen ninety eight impeachment. Mm -hmm. So if your claim is that there was a backlash, and we got hurt politically. Or the Republicans got hurt politically by that meeting. It's actually not true. They got the presidency in 2000. So, you know, I think that there's a lot of ahistorical thinking going on here. But I do, I mean, that is, they've convinced themselves that it's not politically wise for them to pursue impeachment. They're putting party over country. Yep. You know, and, and that's yeah. the dangerous road we're on. Um, I, I want to bring up the one issue, too, because I, I keep on banging my head trying to think about what the senators, uh, the Republicans, said. what are they gaining? And, I mean, what do they get? What are they getting from this president? And I think it's the ju judici yep. judicial system. They want all very conservative judges. I think, they're right. also, I think they're also terrified of the Republican primary vote. Yes, they are. He, uh, he still has a very high approval rating amongst Republicans. It's, it's dropped from about 83%, I just saw this morning, to, I don't know, 69% or mm -hmm. something said they would vote for him. Again, there's Republican yes, okay. primary people, but I think that a lot of these... Republican members of Congress yeah. are afraid if they break with him, they'll be primary from the right. And the Republican, if you think of George W. Bush when he left office in a total, talk about a fiasco, he still had 37, 38% support. That's the majority of Republican primary voters. And so if you are a senator running for re-election in 2020 and you break with him, you're afraid that you'll you'll be primary by some. I, I that's my point. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's anybody's guess, but that's my analysis. That, that, that as long but, as Republicans yeah. support him at the levels that they do, these guys would rather <laughs> lose in the general election than they'll get a nice fat job with um, you know industry or corporate America. But if they break <laughs> with him, they're done. But they're here's here's one polling statistic that's worth. Uh, Remembering in October 1973, as the Judiciary Committee began its impeachment inquiry, less than 30% of the public supported impeachment at that time. By contrast, today, 46% support impeaching Trump. Now, surely they're much more on the Democratic side, some independents, not as many Republicans, but that's a huge number without any case having been made at the national level by Congress. So I think that those numbers only go up. Uh, when the process does begin. At so point. remind us, in the 70s, who gave the leadership to impeachment, not when it got going, but to the beginning? How did it begin? Or you're saying who <coughs> began? Who, who led the charge to make it begin? In the House. In, in the, the House, House was Peter Rodino, the chair of the House Judiciary Committee. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, actually, Elizabeth Holtzman, who's written a book, mm -hmm. The Case for Impeaching Trump, she was on the Judiciary Committee, uh, a, a congressional representative from New York. Yeah. She has said publicly uh, in recent months that the reason why impeachment proceedings began was not because of any special prosecutor report or any new uh, major scandal that occurred. It was because the people demanded it. And I think that is, at the end of the day, why we have this impeachment campaign. What people? The 30%? Well, she claims that there were enough phone calls coming mm -hmm. in, enough letters being written to members of Congress, that that's what pushed people but to start those hearings. Happening. Yeah. Not yeah. enough, no. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, I, you know, I would love to see this body, along with others, help make Massachusetts be the first state mm -hmm. in, in the country to call on its congressional representatives to start impeachment proceedings. I would love to see further pressure on Jim McGovern, whom I love, but who needs to hear from his constituents that he needs to be out front on impeachment. He voted the right way, and he was forced to vote by Congressman Al Green 
in December of 2017 and January of 2018, Congressman Al Green of Houston forced a vote on articles of impeachment, and 66 members of Congress went on record, and McGovern was one of them. But, you know, he's more recently said, I don't care about, I'm not focused on impeachment. Yeah. He's been very dismissive of it. And then, of course, Richie Neal, same kind of thing. You know, so we have right in our backyard here members of Congress who could be pushed. In these districts, if you poll on the, 30% is certainly nationwide, right, uh, during that time. But you poll in this district and the neighboring district where people are on impeachment, I think you're going to get 75 plus percent. The governor is having a fundraiser in the park fairly soon. I mean, I got it. Yes, the I saw that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I think he needs to hear from us. And I also think, again, Joe Comfort, Lindsay Sabato said they've introduced this resolution in the State House, and we ought to we ought to support it and, and, and push it because you know that I I agree with Holtzman. I think that we've got to demonstrate the public pressure for this. So that's what if, if you had an action item. Yeah, for this those would be, be it. to call um, the governor's office and call Neil's office and uh, well, I, look, I mean, for P starting impeachment. PDA has a history with McGovern, obviously. So I would say more than call. I would say ask Jim McGovern to show up at your next meeting to discuss where he stands on impeachment. You know, that you want to hear from him. And then you advertise it to the entire list and people show up and, and let him hear it. I mean, I joined Congressman McGovern at the Black Sheep, as some of you may know, in February of 2017. Uh, and, you know, at that time... Uh, we didn't know what kind of crowd would show up. It was about 100. Uh, and the purpose of it was a conversation where the two of us would talk about this. He was gracious to show up, uh, but at the same time it was clear then, as he has been since, that you know now is not the time uh, for impeachment proceedings. So he has to keep hearing from his district. So what is this resolution that's going to be proposed? And is that the focal point that, is the that focal triggers point. a... Uh, well, it, it only the triggers it so 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 it, committee. it only triggers it if you have a majority of the house voting right. for it. Mm -hmm. um, but does it have to go to the whole house or just the judiciary? Committee? The, the house as a whole has to authorize the judiciary committee to start mm -hmm. impeachment proceedings. Yeah. So, okay. one of the things that again we're trying to do with this resolution is to counter the false narrative that what the impeachment advocates want is an immediate vote on articles of impeachment, and sending it over to the Senate. So these will not be articles of impeachment. This will be this resolution for the start, formal start of an impeachment inquiry before the House. Mm -hmm. And for those who say, we don't have enough evidence to issue the charges yet, we say, fine, we're not asking for the charges. We have more than sufficient evidence to start the inquiry. So mm -hmm. that's the ask of McGovern, that's the ask of every other member of Congress to join Congresswoman to leave in co-sponsoring her resolution to start an impeachment inquiry and to have you know, a, a majority vote on it. Now, if the leadership will not allow this to the floor, she will likely force it with a discharge petition to the floor. Mm -hmm. So that will give the opportunity for a majority of members of Congress to vote on it <coughs> if they so choose. Uh, you know, and let's be clear, Congressman McGovern is a very powerful member of the House mm -hmm. leadership. He's the chair of the House Rules Committee. Yes. Yeah. If he wants to break away from the other committee chairs and say, I'm hearing from my constituents, I need to join Congresswoman to leave. He could do that, and it would mean a lot. And same with Richie yeah. Neal, right? I know it's a lot more. We'll never, we'll there. never move Richie, but yeah. we could definitely invite Jim to our next meeting. What do you think, Kelly? Yeah. All I can say is no. I'll yeah. join you if he comes. Um, but I think I think he, he he ought to be hearing that PDA wants him to speak on this question yeah. and explain. Or if he has position. time constraints, we can offer to meet there in his office. Monday is usually a pretty decent people in there. That's, that's Monday's usually a pretty good day to Mondays and Fridays are good days to, to yeah. get Congress yeah. people yeah. there to be. But I would I would suggest a larger venue than this. Mm -hmm. I mean again, the black sheep, very little outreach and a hundred yeah. people showed up. Yeah. I'm sure Nick Seaman and Black Sheep would be happy to host yeah. it there again. But I would suggest an invitation for him to meet yes. uh, with PBA at a, at a bigger venue and then you advertise it widely and he comes to explain. And, you know, he has his town hall events, but that's kind of a smorgasbord of all things that he wants this to have a meeting on teachers. This is the meeting. Yeah. You know, yeah. To have a discussion yeah. of where he is on this. Well, we were actually talking about idea. having something uh, April, I think. So that's next month. Maybe that's what we do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
No, give them a choice of... You can't use a fundraiser. What? You can't use a 